Um, well, it happens that the Institute uh, has had a special interest in um, uh, revisionism. That is, a, what is, what's a revisionism? Well, it's a revision of the standard government line, especially in regard to wars. And it has to do with any government. We're particularly concerned, of course, with the American government. When a, a war occurs, uh, the government feels that it's obliged uh, to, uh, to uh, propound a certain uh, line about um, how the enemy was totally responsible for this war. We never did anything wrong. Uh, the enemy is, uh, uh, has committed terrible atrocities during the war. We've been uh, gentlemen, sort of Robert E. Lee's all the time. <coughs> And in the aftermath of the war, we acted with complete uh, uh, honesty and, and uh, justice. Well, that's always a government line, and understandably. Because war demands such sacrifice, especially modern wars, such sacrifices from the people, that they have to be totally bamboozled into thinking that they are fighting for the total and absolute good, and the enemy um, uh, is demonic. So revisionism changes that. It, it, it doesn't have to totally reverse that, but it modifies that. If it, if it weren't for revisionism, we'd still, <laughs> we'd still believe that, uh, uh, the Spani that, the, that the Spaniards blew up uh, the, uh, the Maine in Havana Harbor, uh, of which there's no evidence whatsoever, and it's counterintuitive that the ones who would uh, most uh, have to suffer from uh, blowing up uh, the Maine uh, would believe that uh, uh, the United States uh, uh, entered World War I because of, of uh, terrible violations of our rights uh, by the uh, Germans rather than any uh, 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 plans that uh, the administration had uh, for getting into the war for its own larger purposes. Uh, we believe that, uh, um, well, every single time the United States has attacked, uh, Pearl Harbor is the outstanding example, but when the hostages were taken in Tehran during the Carter administration, uh, when other things have happened in more recent uh, American history, it's always foreigners who are just totally insane. I mean, they, they're psychotic <laughs> for no good reason. Well, take the Japanese in, this, in Pearl Harbor. For no good reason, the Japanese decided to attack the United States. They had, they had about, I think, about 10% of the GNP of the United States. They knew, they knew what America was like. Uh, and yet they, they decided to do, well, you know, crazy foreigners, all foreigners are essentially crazy, <laughs> and, the, and the ones who attack the United States even more crazy. Now, I say that the uh, 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 Mises Institute has a special interest in the revisionism. We have a book called Reassessing the Presidency. Reassessing the Presidency, I mean, a nice, mild, judicious sort of title. Uh, in fact, it is, a, <laughs> it is a demolition of every president dealt with. Uh, and I had, I, in that volume, I happen to have a, uh, uh, an essay on Harry, Harry S. Truman, uh, which is now, uh, I think it was, it's subtitled, Advancing the, the Revolution. Uh, the original title I wanted, Lou said, no, we can't use it. That, would, that was Harry S. Truman, uh, The Little Louse. Um, um, a little heavy on value judgment, he thought. Uh, but the book that's uh, relevant to what uh, we're talking about today is this, okay, The Costs of War, America's Pyrrhic Victories, edited by John Denson, and it has essays by, uh, uh, by Joe Salerno, uh, by uh, uh, a, a, a number of essays by Murray, two essays by me, it, which are really worth the price of the book, uh, which is not very much to begin with. Um, um, a, 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 a number of essays on the Civil War, the aftermath of it, and uh, and so on. Joe Stromberg on the Spanish-American War, and uh, I say this in all sincerity: if you never buy another book in your whole life, this is the book you have to buy. Okay, it might seem like an extreme and <coughs> judgment vir virgin on the psychotic, but uh, n not really. This is a <laughs> or. or in the bookstore, you can. Uh, uh, this will this will be. I'll return this. So this is the one that's that's uh, not uh, uh, wrapped, and you can glance through this and and see what you think. And uh, uh, much of what I can't talk about uh, today will be included in my essay on the uh, first on the First World War. First World War was indeed, as I subtitled my uh, essay, goes was indeed a turning point. Imagine to yourself a 20th century 
without Nazis and without communists. Uh, because why? Well, uh, as far as the communists went, uh, Lenin's uh, 10,000 Bolsheviks uh, in 1914 would not have been able to overthrow the imperial Russian army of five million. What had to be done was that the imperial Russian army had to first be pulverized by the Germans. Uh, and then in the chaos that ensued and so on, the, the, Bolshev the communists were able to come to power. As, uh, as far as the Nazis go, um, if the monarchy had uh, been retained in Germany, uh, it's impossible to believe, first of all, that Hitler could have assumed the degree of power and control that he did, because he would have been under the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, leadership of the Kaiser. There was still a Kaiser. In, Ital in Italy, there was a monarchy. So that when the time came and Italian public opinion and everybody turned against Mussolini because obviously he'd gotten Italy into such a stupid, crazy war, uh, Mussolini was dismissed because the monarch was still above Mussolini. What I'm saying is if that situation had existed in Germany, it's very hard to see that the Nazis could either, even have come to power. I mean, there would have been nationalists and so on, but not these uh, fanatical exterminationist uh, anti-Semites who did come to power in, in Germany. So I'm saying the 20th century without communists and without Nazis. But there's an, another point uh, about this, another uh, aspect of the uh, uh, aftermath of the First World War that deserves to be mentioned, that's very important. Uh, there's a British historian who died some time back, a few years ago, named A.J.P. Taylor. I know that, you know, one distrusts these Brits who have three initials at the beginning but, of their names, but, uh, and rightfully so. But, uh, uh, and he was a leftist historian also, but he was a good historian, a very provocative historian. He wrote an enormous amount. And this is how he starts one of his books about uh, British history after 1914. Until August 1914, a sensible, law-abiding Englishman could pass through life and hardly notice the existence of the state, uh, beyond the post office and the policeman. Uh, he could live where he, uh, where he liked uh, uh, and as he liked. He had no official number or identity card. He could travel abo abroad and leave the country forever without a passport or any sort of official per permission. Um, for that matter, a foreigner could spend his whole life in, in Britain without permit and without informing the police. Um, substantial uh, householders were occasionally called on for, for jury duty. Otherwise, um, there were, uh, the state was, uh, uh, had been reduced to a very small amount. Uh, the Englishmen paid taxes on a modest scale, um, something like 8% uh, of the national income in 1914. Um, the state uh, uh, had been expanding to a certain extent. Um, uh, since uh, 1909, it had provided a meager pension for the needy over the age of 70, uh, uh, of which, of course, there were very few uh, people who lived that, uh, that long. Um, since 1911, it helped to ensure certain classes of workers on sickness and, and employment. Um, Still, broadly speaking, the state, the British state, acted only to help those who could not help themselves, and it left adult citizens alone. All this was changed by the impact of the Great War. Now, um, so this is this is the uh, long, uh, uh, the long run, the really long run um, consequence of the of the Great War everywhere. The United States is also a very good example of that. Now, a book which you can also pick up downstairs in paperback, which is um, really a seminal work and a, uh, uh, a resource um, that you could go back to again and again, is by Robert Higgs uh, called Crisis and Leviathan. And it's about the growth of the American state since the time of the Civil War, principally through war. Um, and he, and he, uh, Higgs is an economic, an economist first of all, an economic historian, but also a very good historian. Crisis and Leviathan. And what he shows is after every one of our wars, the, every, by every uh, uh, measure, the state expanded tremendously. 
after the war it's diminished somewhat but it never goes back to what it was before it's a kind of ratchet effect you know it goes up and then goes down but not back to the uh, pre-war level and in this way state power has um, uh, tended to expand and accumulate in the um, uh, um, since the middle of the 19th century now can everybody see this here can everybody see this map can everybody can you see this map can you see this map can you see this map okay now this is well first of all it's a, uh, a board game called diplomacy uh, but but uh, that's relatively trivial matter it's a, it's a map of Europe in 1914 um, now, much in my essay, I talk about all the background of all of, all of this. But by 1914, uh, two power blocks um, confronted confronted each other in Europe. Uh, there was first of all the power uh, the power block that Bismarck had created. When Bismarck unified the Reich in 1871, his concern was that Germany should have a long period of peace because any kind of great war. Uh, he thought would tend to destabilize Germany. Germany was now united for the first time. There'd never been something called Germany. There'd been the Holy Roman Empire, something totally different. But now there was a Germany, and it was a somewhat fragile thing. Uh, it would take time for the different German peoples, the Prussians and Saxons and Bavarians and so on, to be knitted into one nation. So he wanted Germany to be at peace. And in order to, to do that, uh, he set up a series of defensive alliances. That is, they would only come uh, into effect if Germany uh, was uh, at war with two other powers, uh, and, he, and Bismarck did not intend to, to bring Germany into war with any uh, two other powers. So, uh, in the, um, uh, ultimately what happened was, we have Germany, this is the Bismarckian Reich from Lithuania, to Alsace-Lorraine, uh, and uh, that was the center of uh, the uh, what was called the Triple Alliance. <coughs> Germany's ally was Austria-Hungary, and Austria-Hungary, which uh, all, you know, all the other countries exist in some form uh, today, but Austria-Hungary was uh, blown up uh, after the uh, uh, First World War. And um, I don't really care for Winston Churchill that much. Uh, which you can read about in in, um, in this book. Uh, however, uh, Churchill said that the that the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire was a w it's con it consists of all of these smaller peoples in uh, Central Europe, uh, but the Austro-Hungarian Empire was a way of these small people to to stand together and uh, to uh, uh, guard against being swallowed up by uh, uh, by the great powers. Uh, it was a home for them. Uh, the Czechs and the, Slo the Czechs and the Slovaks and the Poles and the Ruthenians, the Hungarians, the Romanians also, uh, the, the Croats, uh, the Serbs, Italians down here, uh, the, the Hungarians and uh, the Germans, the, the, Austro the Austrian Germans in, in the Austrian Crown lands and in the Sudetenland. Uh, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, as we'll see, our president Woodrow Wilson thought that uh, monarchies are a terrible thing to begin with, uh, and also every country, uh, every people should have its own state. Uh, so Austria-Hungary was doomed as as soon as uh, uh, they lost uh, uh, the war. Now, the uh, this triple alliance by 1914. Notice how smoothly I do this. Okay. Okay, is that up there? Oh, <laughs> and people call me a technological moron. Um, this is the world. This is the, this is the world in 1914. Um, this triple alliance was faced by a triple entente of Great Britain, France, and Russia. Now, look at the world in 1914. Here's Germany. Germany has a couple, has a few really miserable colonies. The Cameroons, German East Africa, Southwest Africa. They have part of New Guinea. They have a, a few of the Samoan Islands. 
and this is, I mean, and, and I say miserable uh, uh, empire. They came very late to the thing, and uh, the empire was was worthless. It cost a lot more than the Germans ever got from it in any by any measure, trade or investment or anything. Uh, after the Second World War, these colonies are taken away from Germany, which really was a good thing. But that's Germany. This is essentially Germany. Okay. Now, it's a good idea to, to uh, if you're confronted with some opponent, to understand the world from the opponent's point of view. I mean, how does the opponent see the world? Well, there's Germany. On one side we have France. This triple entente: uh, France, Britain, and Russia. On one side we have France the second best army in the world. On the other side we have the Russian Empire that goes through 11 time zones and has an army larger than the German, French and Austrian army put together. There are real problems with the Russians but they do have this massive army. <coughs> and then finally they have Great Britain, the center, the only world power and the center of a world empire one quarter of the globe, one quarter of the population of the globe. This is an empire in which Egypt is one minor part. Uh, this is an empire that uh, Canada and Australia are, are white dominions, but really a minor part. They have, there's the British Raj here, see this? The Raj, R-A-J, the British dominion over India. Um, and what, everything else you, you see, uh, you find uh, pink here. Um, so the Germans are confronted with the French army, the Russians on the other side, and the British Empire, and also Britain, the financial capital of the world. From the German point of view, what can they depend on? The only thing they can depend on is their own army. Now, by 1914 there had been a number of crises where Europe nearly went to war. And of course, all of the uh, uh, all of the different uh, European powers had uh, had contingency plans in the event of the Great War. I mean, you know, they don't wait until the last minute to come up with a plan of how to deal with uh, with their enemies. The most famous was the Schlieffen Plan, uh, named after the German, the head of the German General Staff, uh, of what to do in the event of a war on two fronts that is a war with France and with Russia simultaneously. Um, well, I'm, uh, uh, I'm kind of important in this institute, so I have recently learned from Lou that the position of Commander-in-Chief of the World Libertarian Armies is open. Now, a test of this, uh, I'd be interested to know, what would you do if you were the uh, the Germans, the head of the, of the uh, German army, faced with this problem? This was a problem that was posed to the general staff. What to do in the event of a two-front war? Uh, our old friend Murray Rothbard is not with us, unfortunately. His answer would have been to surrender, but we don't. Uh, that's out of the question. Okay. So what what would you do here? Here, you look like a... Me? Not who, who, me? No. Me? Who? <laughs> Whenever, where, where you see this deadly laser pointed? Yes, yes, yes. You look like a military type. Oh, okay, who's a military type? Who's had any military... Okay, David. Take over France first? Why? What about splitting up your forces, half against France and half against Russia? Yes. A little louder. If you're confronted with uh, bigger forces than you, superior forces and numbers, you have to stay on the defense. You have to do what? Stay on the defense or use well, the but, the, but if you stay on the defense, the idea was a combined French and, and, uh, British and uh, Russian forces would, could be enough to crack Germany as a, like a walnut. R yes. What? Good. You have to deal with one of them. You have to knock out one of them real quick. <laughs> no, no, but we're talking about the war breaking out now. Now, which one would be possible to... <coughs> Who said that? Okay, why France? Uh, it's a smaller, less populated, smaller army, better chance to 
Yeah, well, there's no way of knocking out Russia. I mean, you don't knock out Russia. You could eventually defeat Russia, but you don't knock out Russia because they do what, what they did uh, uh, against Napoleon, and that is simply retreat. And then you'd have to follow them there, but what are the French doing in the meantime? They're going to invade from the West. So the idea is to knock France out quickly. And this was the Schlieffen plan. To concentrate on knocking France out within just a few weeks. And uh, once, they, once they knock France out, or at, or at least the French have to retreat the south of the Loire, uh, then the German army will be shuttled across Germany's excellent railroads to the Eastern Front to meet the Russians probably somewhere in East Prussia. And if the Russians, which uh, uh, they intended to do, mobilized and, and attacked. But in this plan, everything depended on timing. Uh, because uh, uh, if they took, t took too much time in knocking France out, then the Russians, uh, although they were very, they'd be very slow in mobilizing, would in fact finally mobilize and then bring their forces <coughs> into Germany. So quickly knock out France. And this uh, terrain here uh, on the actual French-German border tended, tended to be uh, uh, hilly, mountainous in, in places. So the Schlieffen plan depended on going through Belgium. Okay? And, well, uh, you can read about the uh, uh, crisis of the summer of 1914 in uh, my essay, by the way, which is also online, um, as, uh, without the footnotes, however, but in, in this book. And um, I have another essay uh, online that is uh, on lourockwell.com uh, under my archives on recent uh, uh, literature bef uh, after this on uh, the First World War. Okay, they'd have to go through Belgium, but uh, Belgium uh, had been guaranteed, Belgian neutrality had been guaranteed by the powers when Belgium was created in the 1830s. Nonetheless, they might have to do that. Now there's this crisis that starts with the assassination of the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne by uh, Bosnian Serbs. Now, Serbia is a little country here, as you can see, uh, but there are also uh, Serbs who live within the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And the Serbs, the Serbs have as their mentor Russia. Uh, this has been for a long time a kind of sentimental uh, uh, relationship between the Orthodox Russians and the Orth Orth Orthodox uh, Serbs. Um, uh, the Russians had masterminded a, a Balkan League to th uh, try to throw the Ottomans totally out of Europe in the Balkan Wars of 1912-1913, and the end result is that you have a pretty formidable, uh, small but formidable Serbian army now. The Serbs are intent on uniting all of the South Slavs, including uh, even the Croats and Slovenes, but especially creating a greater Serbia. Why not? Prussia had created a uh, greater Germany. Uh, Piedmont had created a greater Italy. Uh, the Serbs say, you know, why, why should we be left out? Uh, however, the Serbian intention depended on the destruction of Austria-Hungary. Because if the South Slavs were allowed to become independent, then the Czechs and uh, uh, the Romanians would have their, their claim on uh, Transylvania, and the Czechs and uh, maybe even Slovaks would, would withdraw the end of Austria-Hungary. Austria-Hungary was the only halfway reliable ally that uh, Germany had. The Italians, um, just as soon as they entered into this Triple Alliance, began negotiating with the French behind the backs of the Germans. The Italian politicians are, throughout this whole story, are unbelievably contemptible. All of the, uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, all of the political leaders of all of the uh, powers deserve to, to be tried and hanged. The Italians deserve to be uh, captured by Al Qaeda. Let's put it that. <laughs> let's put it that way. Um, so Italy could not be depended on. So what were the Germans going to do if Austria-Hungary were broken up, especially into small Slavic states uh, with great Russian influence? The whole look. The whole southern border of Germany would be vulnerable. The Germany would become militarily indefensible. So. Uh, the Germans had to back up the uh, Austrians. And the Austrians decided to, this was the last straw, the assassination of the Archduke. They were going to um, end this, uh, the, Serb, uh, the Serbian threat once and for all. So there was the ultimatum. 
this, uh, this, uh, this, is, uh, this is a period of a few days, uh, the end of July and the uh, first few days of August of 1914, is probably the best um, um, testified to period in history, because everybody was sending uh, the telegrams from their uh, capital to their d different embassies, uh, people kept journals, uh, people afterwards wrote memoirs, so what happened in these few days is very well attested to. Um, but, uh, well, I'll talk about the uh, war, war guilt clause afterwards. Okay, so the Austrians send a, a memorandum, uh, an ultimatum to Serbia, deliberately worded so that the Serbs would have to turn it down. That is, the Serbs would have to allow the Austrian police to come into Serbia to find out who these assassins were. But it turns out the assassins were directed by the head of mil uh, Serbi Serbian military intelligence. Uh, the Serbian government didn't want anybody to find out that. Uh, so, the, uh, so the Austrians demanded that. The Serbs finally turned down the ultimatum. Now, back in Russia, so far it's just Austria against Serbia. Back in Russia, Sasanov, um, the um, Russian foreign minister, when he saw the text of the Austrian ultimatum to Serbia, cried out, Sela Gea Europeyan. It is the European war. Um, the Serbs, the Austrians intend to destroy Serbia. Really, they did to divide it up. Russia would not permit that. Russia would back up Serbia. Germany would back up Austria. The French would back up the Russians. And this would be indeed the European war. Well, this is what started to happen. Uh, remember, the Schlieffen plan depends on quickness, on rapidity. The poor Tsar, but at the end, you know, it's, uh, William II or Wilhelm II is the Kaiser, and Nicholas II is the Tsar, the last of the Tsars. They're cousins, uh, descended from uh, Queen Victoria, and at the very end, the Kaiser sends uh, telegrams you know, uh, uh, to, to Nicky, sign Willie, because they are cousins and friends and all. Your generals and your admirals tell you to, to mobilize, but don't. If you mobilize, my generals and admirals are going to tell me we, I, we have to mobilize, and then we have war. And there's no way of telling how the war is going to end. How is the war going to end for the Tsar and his family? Yeah. Very bad. Yeah. Ben Benjamin. <laughs> okay, you don't have to be so graphic, Benjamin. <laughs> okay, uh, they're going to be shot to death in the cellar by uh, Bolsheviks. Not, the, not only the Tsar, his whole, his whole family. And the head of the, uh, of the uh, execution squad afterwards, uh, the, the communist execution squad, said that uh, just before he'd killed her, he, he had had the Tsarina. Uh, that's a story to dine out on for a, for a long time, isn't it? So the Tsar and his family are going to be murdered. The Kaiser goes into uh, exile <coughs> in Holland. Uh, he's there in 1940 when another German leader sends his troops in, lived a long time. So it's going to destroy those dynasties, and the, the Kaiser was perfectly right about it. But there was no way of stopping uh, uh, the, the uh, Austrians and Germans, with German backing, were intent on destroying Serbia, the Russians were intent on defending Serbia, and the Russians then started to mobilize. General mobilization along the whole front here, uh, if the Russians mobilized too quickly, it's the end of the Schlieffen plan, because they couldn't, the Germans couldn't, they thought, couldn't afford to send their army uh, in, into France with the Russians mobilizing so quickly. So, the Germans send an ultimatum to the French and to the Russians on August 1st, uh, to the Russians cease general mobilization at once. To the French, what would you do, hypothetically speaking, in the event of a war between Germany and Russia. And if you promise to remain neutral, kindly hand over the fortresses at Toul and Verdun, which control the northern approaches to Paris, to be garrisoned by the German army. In other words, you know, surrender. Uh, those ultimatums were rejected, and the German army now sets off to the conquest of France. Britain had a big problem. It was not, did not have a formal alliance. It had an, uh, a cordial understanding, an entente cordiale, 
with France. But over the years, there have been secret conversations between the French military, British military, the politicians, and so on. And the French had every reason to believe that if they were involved in a war with Germany, the British would come to their defense. However, the British public didn't know about these uh, commitments. Parliament didn't know about the commitments. The majority of the British cabinet didn't know about the commitments. So they were, they were in a real quandary. How, how was this, the government going to get Britain into the war? Which honored, demanded, since uh, the French were depending on it. And the Germans solved their problem. They invaded Belgium. And now the British foreign minister could go bef uh, in front of the uh, uh, House of Commons and say, Britain must get into this war. Because Britain has always been a, uh, a defender of the rights of little people. Um, some, somebody in the back uh, said, what about Ireland? And he was taken out and shot. Um, so Britain is now in the war, and that's a key, because if Britain had been in the war, we wouldn't have been in the war. Now, a number of things uh, happened uh, immediately. First, and the most important is the British hunger blockade. There were rules of, of, of blockade that were pretty well ex accepted, and the British violated all of them. They, s they simply set mines, permanent, uh, you know, not floating mines, but permanent mines, in the entrance to the, uh, to the um, uh, English Channel and in the entrance to the North Sea. Um, they knew where the mines were, of course, so they could, any ships that they would uh, want to allow to, to get in, they could. They would guide them through the minefields and so on. But these effectively blockaded Germany. Uh, but it, was not legal by international law. You know, by international law, you have to have a close-in blockade with surface ships. Besides, the British in, um, uh, made up a list of contraband, uh, which uh, nobody else uh, agreed to, because among other things, it included food for the civilian population. Um, you know, Americans um, uh, tend to think of the British, uh, the English especially, as sort of effete, right? Um, drinking tea with their pinky up and, uh, as we Americans say, living on Gay Street. Um, but, um, uh, you know, you know it, it's not wimps who, who, who create the greatest empire in the history of the world, right? Who, who create this empire that spans the globe and so on. So when it comes to it, when it comes to their own interest, the English can be totally ruthless. And this is what they intended to do. Churchill was the first lord of the admiralty. He said, we intend to starve the German civilian population, <laughs> men, women, children, invalids, uh, into submission by denying them food. If you've ever read the best uh, literary work to come out of, or anyway, the most famous literary work to come out of the First World War, All Quiet on the Western Front, by Remark, okay, uh, you'll see towards the end, the German, the German soldiers are starving, they're starving back home, and, uh, and uh, so on. So that really was the most um, powerful tool that, uh, or weapon that was used on, on, um, on uh, either side in the war, uh, is grinding the, uh, uh, the Germans down. The British are, uh, also have been uh, uh, superb in propaganda. Anything that, in, in any conflict that happens, the, the British are always on the side of, well, you know, fair play, decency, justice, uh, the Protestant way of life, uh, virtue, all the good things. And if they have to smash your face in uh, in order to uh, promote these values, well, that's also necessary. Uh, the British uh, now started with their propaganda campaign. And the, and the uh, first thing that Americans hear about this German army that's um, going through uh, Belgium is that they are unbelievably, they, they act like unbelievable savages. These, these are the stories that start coming out of Belgium, the Belgian atrocities, as they're known. They are, they are um, not only killing babies, but sort of tossing babies on one, from one bayonet to another. Uh, they're crucifying uh, soldiers on barn walls. Raping nuns is a, is a three times a day activity for any German soldier. Right? And Americans are a little shocked by this. After all, there are a lot of Germans in our country. Right? Cincinnati's a German city, St. Louis is a German city, 
uh, Milwaukee, millions and millions of Germans. Nobody ever said that they were the wittiest people in the world, right? Um, and as far as German cooking goes, the famous saying is that you eat a German meal and then 72 hours later you're hungry all over again. <laughs> How How However, however, nobody ever thought this of the Germans. The Germans who lived in America, yeah, they're decent people. Everybody welcomed them as uh, neighbors. Uh, but now, gee, it must really be, as the British are saying, that it is a fight between civilization and barbarism. Lucky for the British, they had in, uh, an administration in Washington uh, that was, well, Anglophile is not does not describe it sufficiently. Uh, that's a whole story in itself. The uh, President of the United States at this time was... <laughs> Who was the President of the United States in the, second, in the First World War? What? What did you say? I said I am calling on this young man because whoever doesn't get it right, of course, is, doesn't get any more food at, uh, at our conference. Now, who was the president? Yes. Thomas Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson. And um, he was um, uh, an Anglophile. His great confidant, Colonel House, was an Anglophile. The American ambassador to, to England, to Britain, was so uh, Anglophile that uh, uh, he even disgusted uh, the Brits. Uh, the administration was filled with uh, Anglophiles, people who thought that England really was uh, fighting our fight, except for the Secretary of State, William Jennings Bryan. Well, uh, there was a famous case of the Lusitania. You know, all these uh, mystery ships in American history, uh, say the uh, USS Maine in Havana Harbor, uh, or the Lusitania, not an American ship, but a... Uh, a, a a uh, crucial factor, um, uh, or those battleships in a row, one after the other at Pearl Harbor, just lined up, uh, or the uh, uh, naval U.S. Navy destroyers in the uh, Gulf of Tonkin. You, you know these these odd things that happen to the ships in American history. Lusitania, the Lusitania, which is a, a British passenger ship. Uh, headed from New York to Liverpool, is uh, encountered by a German submarine right here, south of Ireland, and uh, sunk. Uh, the, uh, the German submarine captain, when he raises his periscope, sees, uh, is a, uh, is he? He sees a cliff in front of him, he sees, and he sees the most famous ship in the world, the Lusitania. And um, Lusitania happens to be carrying munitions, um, <coughs> Churchill, uh, Chir Churchill is the first Lord of the Admiralty. He had, he had already given orders, which the Germans had captured, that any passenger ship um, confronted by a German uh, 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 submarine that comes to the surface should turn around and ram the submarine. The uh, submarines were very fragile in those days. So the German uh, captain just uh, torpedoes the, the Lusitania. Now, the outrage was great in certain circles in America. You know, in the millions and millions of farmers in the South, the Midwest, the miners in the West, they really didn't care about these Americans who were traveling to England in, in the course of the war. Who do you who, what Americans do you suppose are traveling to England in the middle of a war? They're going to England for the Henley Regatta, for, for uh, Ascot, uh, for the uh, season, this is May, for the season and so on. It's the Anglophile elite in America. Uh, it's the, uh, uh, the Blue Bloods from Boston to, to uh, Washington uh, and uh, centered in, in New York City. They're the ones who, who cry bloody murder about the, uh, about the Lusitania. Now, the U.S. doesn't get into war at this time, this is May 1915, but Wilson sends, sets down the policy. The Germans will be held strictly accountable for any loss of American life through submarine action, regardless of the flag of the ship that the uh, Americans are traveling on. Now that's un unheard of. I mean, it's, 
it's, it's the uh, country whose flag it is that has a responsibility for dealing with attacks or in one way or another. But um, any American uh, traveling on it, and this is regardless of the fact uh, uh, that the uh, ship might be carrying munitions and that it, the ship, the merchant ship might be armed. Okay, merchant ships are not permitted to be armed. Well, Brian, the U.S. Secretary of State, resigns over this. He says, I'm not going to put up with this. We are sanctioning a policy uh, of the British uh, sending uh, mixed cargoes of bullets and babies across the uh, Atlantic, and uh, we're going to somehow uh, hold only the Germans responsible if something <laughs> goes wrong. And the Germans say, no, what, are you, I mean, what are you talking about? Uh, why don't, uh, President Wilson, why don't you say that Americans have the right um, to travel unmolested, let's say from Paris to Brussels, and if somehow they are sh uh, shot at uh, by uh, Germans, then the Germans will be held responsible. Because that's what you did with, the, with uh, this British uh, munitions carrying uh, ship, going through a war zone, and in fact a submarine zone, and um, the Americans were, were uh, killed, and now you're holding us responsible. Why don't why did you say that Americans have the right to travel? If they traveled from Paris to Brussels, they'd be going through something called what? Yeah, something called the Western Front, right. Um, but nonetheless, the Germans said, okay, we'll, we'll calm, calm it down. Uh, but this was always in, in abeyance. Now, the British were violating American rights by setting up this uh, illegal blockade and not permitting, according to international law, a, sh a ship going from a neutral port, New York, to a neutral port, Rotterdam, had the right to, to carry anything it wanted. And it certainly had the right to carry food. But the British were stopping such American uh, ships. They were stopping Amer American mail. They were setting up a uh, blacklist of American companies that had anything to do with Germany and uh, preventing them from engaging in international trade. And the Americans well, started sending, said, okay, we're, we're complaining to the British also. Um, we don't, we're not letting them uh, uh, get away with it. Um, Okay. Okay. The man who replaced um, uh, Brian as Secretary of State was Robert Lansing. After the war, he wrote his memoirs. Uh, he said, in dealing with the British government, that is, in complaining about their, their violation of American <coughs> rights, there was always in my mind the conviction that we would ultimately become an ally of Great Britain and that it would uh, not do, therefore, to let our con controversies reach a point where diplomatic consequences gave place to action. <coughs> he said, once we joined the British in the war, we would presumably wish to uh, adopt some of the policies and practices which the British adopted. For we too then would be aimed to, quote, destroy the morale of the German people by economic uh, isolation which would cause them to lack the very ne uh, necessaries of life. So this is, a, this is a sham, this is a facade, the Americans complaining to the British as the Secretary of State after, afterwards admitted. He said, everything we did was submerged in verbiage. It was done de with deliberate purpose. It ensured the continuance of the controversy, continuance of the controversy and left the questions unsettled which was necessary in order to leave the country, this country, free to act and even act illegally when it entered the war. So, if you uh, hear that after the First World War the American people became terrible, dreadful isolationists, they knew they had been lied into this war. Here the Secretary of State is admitting that there had been a um, system of lies because uh, we intended to get, get in on the side of the British anyway, and we wanted to do what the British were doing, starving the Germans to death. Um, well, okay, so uh, what happens then finally is that, um, by the way, the best, the best uh, book on the Wilson administration and the, and the war is by Walter Karp, K-A-R-P, called The Politics of War. The Politics of War. I think uh, it is in, in print again. And you can follow in detail President Wilson's uh, changing policy, uh, policies. 
What was behind uh, uh, Wilson's uh, actions ultimately was his desire to get into the war in order for America to have a leading voice in the creation of the new world order. And the feeling was, a legitimate feeling, the British and the French have, been, have sacrificed so much that uh, we, have to, we have to get into the war, and we have to get into the war in a big way. We have to be what uh, uh, British uh, sportsmen call blooded. Uh, they don't allow fox hunting in England anymore. Uh, but when they did, uh, your young fella and your dad or your uncle was taking you out uh, now with a group to hunt foxes for the first time. The first time you kill a fox, they take the animal and smear blood on your cheek. Uh, you're blooded. Uh, that is, you, now you have taken part in killing. You have uh, killing uh, a, a legitimate uh, uh, object, an animal like a fox, and you now have a different status. So the American people, Wilson f felt, had to be blooded before we had a right to sit at the uh, the uh, um, peace conference and Wilson to impose his view of uh, the New World Order with the League of Nations at the center of it. Now, I agree with H.L. Uh, Mencken who said that he despised every American pre president that he lived under. Um, I, I have disliked at least, at least disliked every American president. Uh, I think maybe the last decent American president was Grover Cleveland, who came from Buffalo, by the way, and that's no accident. Um, and, um, but uh, you can have debates about this. You know, was Truman worse than Roosevelt? Was Roosevelt worse than Lincoln? Was Lincoln wor worse than... Uh, and th those are healthy debates. Uh, those, are li those are libertarian debates. You know, which was the worst monster? Um, but the one that I really dislike in a, in a gut kind of way is Woodrow Wilson. And the reason was that he was so unbelievably sanctimonious. H.L. Uh, Mencken, you, you guys know Mencken, right? M-E-N-C-K-E-N. Um, he was a libertarian. He was a, a, the most famous American literary critic of the 20s and 30s. Uh, he's a joy to read even today. And Mencken said, uh, the problem with uh, Wilson was that he was uh, personally deeply convinced that um, he was the logical candidate for the first vacancy in the Trinity. Um, he was, I mean, sanctimonious doesn't begin to capture this guy. And I talk about the details of this just to give you, you know, America went through a horrible uh, uh, campaign against civil liberties worse than the Second World War, really, except for the um, incarceration of the Japanese Americans. But ter terrible, terrible. And um, uh, anybody who criticized uh, the war um, was, in, it was thrown into jail under the uh, Sedition, Espionage and Sedition Act. There was a socialist leader named Eugene Debs. Now look, Americans here, you'll tell me, right? Wilson was, goes down in history as the great idealist. Is that not so? <coughs> A, a, a deeply humane man, and if we had, if America had been sensible enough to follow his uh, ideas, go, go into the League of Nations, there wouldn't have been a Second World War. Uh, however, tragically, Wilson was not able to carry out his great vision. Okay, this is the Wilson. Okay, among other things, among other, among thousands and thousands of people who were imprisoned for expressing their views, was the leader of the Socialist Party, Eugene Debs. He told a, uh, a socialist convention in Ohio, uh, we're in this war because of the bankers. He was arrested, tried, sentenced to 10 years in federal prison. Okay? The war, once the war was over, other countries had amnestied their political prisoners. In 1920, Debs was said to be dying in prison, and petitions came to the White House. To part, for Wilson to pardon Debs, he said, I will never pardon Debs. Uh, he was a traitor, he stabbed our soldiers in the back and all, you know, all that stuff they say, they say. So this is the, this is the humanitarian, this is I the idealist, vindictive to the, to the nth de degree, to the last drop. Uh, so, Wil so Wilson <coughs> finally got us in into war. How that happened was that uh, the hunger, hunger blockade was taking its toll. It's been estimated, by the way, that about 750,000 Germans succumbed. You don't uh, literally die of starvation. The Irish didn't 
generally die of starvation, what happens is malnutrition sets in and you become susceptible to all kinds of diseases. And about three quarters of a million Germans died because of this hunger blockade, which was continued after the war until the Germans finally gave in and signed the Treaty of, of Versailles. Continued for months. Um, so the German, the German generals and admirals told the Kaiser, our only hope now is is to bring uh, England to its knees. And the only way we can do it is through unrestricted submarine warfare. We know the Americans, or Wilson will bring the Americans in. But we hope that before that happens, before a substantial number of Americans come, uh, we'll have forced the English to surrender. So in uh, uh, January of 1917, the, the Germans declare the uh, waters around the British Isles uh, to be... Um, uh, subject to unrestricted submarine warfare. Any ship entering a subject, merchant, uh, more ships of course are always uh, legitimately subject to being uh, sunk, but any merchant ship of any nationality subject to be sunk. And this was their great gamble and it didn't work. Um, and we finally did get, uh, and then the uh, uh, time came when um, uh, some Americans uh, were uh, were killed. It wasn't any massive amount. The, only, the massive amount was <coughs> was at, uh, with the Lusitania, uh, and that was only 128. But a number of Americans are killed, and now Wilson goes before Congress, as Roosevelt will also. You know, a, an odd thing: we have these presidents who like to grab power as much as they can, everywhere they can, and yet. They were, uh, what, uh, uh, um, ashamed enough after they read the Constitution to feel they actually had to go to Congress and ask for a declaration of war <laughs> in the old-fashioned days, right? Um, it's a, it's a, um, uh, a sign of how things have changed. When um, uh, the uh, uh, prohibitionists wanted to prohibit the um, uh, sale of alcohol by, uh, by the federal government, they felt that they had to uh, to have a constitutional amendment that otherwise the federal government had no jurisdiction over the consumption of alcohol by Americans. Then that was the 18th Amendment. Nowadays, the federal government does any damn thing it wants, right? It prohibits drugs, uh, any kind of drugs. It prohibits this, guns. Uh, pro prohibits that, and so on, without any constitutional amendment, because now. <coughs> People feel the federal government can do anything it wants. So Wilson went before Congress and said, uh, we have to get into this war. Uh, and and uh, it wasn't because of these uh, uh, alleged violation of American rights. It was to make the world itself safe for democracy, at last to make the world itself free. Okay? This is the line of global democracy and America's responsibility to spread it throughout the world, which we see in action t today in the American government. And uh, he said, uh, here I stand, I can do no other, uh, very Protestant. Everybody knew that that uh, went back to Martin Luther, your stage, uh, before a Catholic uh, tribunal. Here I stand, I can do no other. Uh, why? Because justice, I'm so, in, I, I'm so fired by justice, I, but I, I'm burning up with uh, the sense of justice and righteousness, and we have to declare war. And the, the whole uh, uh, establishment there went crazy. They weren't crazy for this war out in the, uh, in the Great Plains and the southern farms. <laughs> the American blacks were not really anxious for uh, America to spread uh, democracy and justice throughout the world. Uh, they, they were busy enough uh, avoiding getting lynched. Um, and, um, and, and the German Americans didn't like it, the Irish Americans didn't like it, but the people who counted in America liked it very, very much. Now in Bob Higgs's book, Robert Higgs's book, Crisis in Leviathan, you can read the details. This is the, cr the, cr this is the creation of the great American state. Um, you know, they nationalized the railroads. Herbert Hoover is uh, put in charge of all of food and fuel production. Bernard Baruch is put in charge of, uh, of uh, uh, rationing of, of uh, scarce minerals and scarce commodities. Uh, rent control is put in for the first time. 
in a few places, New York and Washington. <coughs> uh, the draft, the first time Americans now are drafted to, to fight in, uh, in a uh, foreign war. Um, and on and on. The FBI, well, the, uh, what is it? It's called, not the, Federal, uh, not the Federal Bureau of Investigation, but I think, I don't know. The, Amer the, the Bureau of Investigation, I think, is set up for the first time. A national police force. Uh, and on and on and on. Uh, and once the war is over, many of these things are rescinded, but never back to what it was before. And uh, a prohibition is put in, uh, um, uh, by the way. <clears throat> and um, we go through, as I think Mark uh, Thornton talked about that, we go through that great uh, experiment, and uh, Americans treating themselves like children, uh, keeping themselves from, from, from drinking because of, uh, of the police. The only people who have ever done that. I mean. God bless America. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and the attack on civil liberties, the attack on Germans. A lot could be said about that. Uh, that was uh, that went, went on to the point where I think a lot of people had to consider it just a joke. Uh, I mean, the, the speaking German in public was prohibited in a lot of places. Um, speaking on, uh, on German on the telephone was prohibited altogether because, you know, who knew, who knew what they might be uh, saying. German language papers, of which there were dozens and dozens, were uh, closed down. Irish papers also were closed down. Uh, symphony orchestras made their contribution for the rest of the war they were not going to play any music by German composers <laughs> well I ask you how many times can you listen to Bolero really <laughs> uh, you know or the March Slav or, or something but uh, and uh, German Americans uh, were, uh, were persecuted uh, were, uh, were treated the way uh, uh, communists were going to be treated afterwards and this and then finally the Treaty of Versailles let me just uh, spend a minute and show you this map. Okay. Marshal Fush, who became the supreme commander of the Allied forces on the Western Fronts, when he uh, when they were finished at the Paris, the Paris Peace Conference says, "This is not a peace. This is a truce for twenty years." They had a choice. They could have undone the Bismarck Reich and reduce Germany to small states or they could have recognized reality that Germany was a power just as France had been recognized as a power after the Napoleonic Wars instead they, they uh, uh, encumbered Germany with a lot of uh, uh, details you can read anywhere really but you can read in my essay also uh, limiting its armies, taking away its colonies created a great Poland with the Polish corridor, there's Danzig, German city taken away uh, uh, because Poland needed a uh, a um, port on the on the uh, Baltic. This thing called Czechoslovakia was created. The Czechs and Slovaks had never been together in the same country, and uh, this Czechoslovakia, by the way, had more Germans than Ch than Slovaks um, in the, in something called the Sudetenland. Austria was prohibited from joining. Together with Germany, this was another this was uh, another violation of the principle of self determination. The Treaty of Versailles is, and the whole Paris Peace Conference was a was a whole mess. Just uh, this is a detail. Oh, the British and, and French, of course, were fighting for world democracy. Um, there were problems with that, and that was that they all got together and divided up the spoils, even while the war was going on. One reason why the Ottoman Empire came in to the war on the side of Germany. Uh, was that they knew what was in store for them if the Russians had won the war, and that and that and the uh, the uh, secret treaties with Britain and France gave uh, the Russians Constantinople and the Straits, with the uh, over there, uh, and um, and and the Allies promised the Arabs that they would support the independence of Arab countries uh, if. Um, if the uh, desert Arabs joined uh, the allies against the Turks. However, at the same time, they promised the Zionists that they would support a national homeland for the Jewish people in Palestine, uh, the Balfour Declaration. So, so these were somewhat contradictory. The British got, oh, and this doesn't show the uh, Eastern Mediterranean, the British got Palestine as a mandate. They created something called Iraq, 
out of a number of different uh, Turkish uh, controlled provinces, with, uh, Kurds and different kinds of Arabs and so on, uh, took away the province of Kuwait, made that a separate little principality, totally under British control. Iraq was under British control. The king had been uh, was appointed by the British. The French were given Syria, and the French out of Syria carved something which had never existed before called Lebanon uh, from the, with the city of Beirut. There was something called Mount Lebanon, something different that had existed. Why did they do this? Because they wanted a Christian majority country as a foothold in, uh, in the Middle East and at that time Lebanon was. Uh, our, our Palestine and Lebanon problems to this day uh, is Iraq uh, with its uh, uh, strange bizarre demographics a problem to this day? Um, sure. Uh, and uh, you can credit the British and French imperialism with that. Um, well, much more uh, um, uh, could be said, but uh, I know that you're all going to be buying this book. Or, okay, okay, oh, yeah, yeah, I know. You have so many things to spend money on. Um, you know, you have to go and see Hall Halloween number 15 or something, uh, or uh, other important movies. Um, but, uh, you can get, as I say, you can get this online uh, on, on my archives on uh, lourockwell.com. Um, anybody who wants to, to leave now, you know, you can. No, not <laughs> you know, stampede. I mean, how embarrassing. But we'll uh, maybe take one or two comments or qu questions. Yes. Okay. Uh, you mentioned early on, and I thought this was extremely interesting, that uh, Austria Hungary was constructed in such a way. Hey, well, this is the old, this is the new no, map. No, that's fine. I can oh yeah. Okay. Okay. But you pointed out that Germany would be vulnerable in the southeast area. Yeah. No the southern boundary. Sure. Land Well, it depends. No, it depends. But the, but the, this here, this would have been the Czech lands. The Sudetenland uh, was historically part of Bohemia and Moravia, which are the Czech lands. So presumably, a uh, Czech uh, Republic or a Czech state would have been set up uh, with a majority, a Slavic majority. Right. But the, okay, I, I can accept that. But they, it doesn't seem like German. It seems to me that you painted a picture. If, that Germany actually was the linchpin to the war. If Germany would have said, we don't really care what happens to Austria, we're yeah. okay, yeah. then there wouldn't have been a war. Right. Uh, and if, if uh, Russia had said, uh, we don't care about Serbia, uh, we're okay, in fact, now, Serbia is a totally different, it has nothing to do with our national defense, uh, then there wouldn't have been a war either. But all of the uh, government elites believed that their vital interests were uh, involved. The British b believed if uh, uh, France was overrun by, by Germany, Germany would have continental hegemony. The French believed that if the Germans, were able, the Germans and Austrians were able to defeat the Russians, then France would have no ally in Europe and France would be at Germany's uh, mercy. Uh, the Germans believed that the Russians were just biding their time until they, the, their industrialization took place, until they were strong enough. Then they would uh, attack Austria and then Germany would be vulnerable. So they all believed they were doing it on behalf of their own national security. Our military expert no. Back, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Do you have? Uh, you uh, mentioned uh, Colonel Mendel House. Yeah. And, uh, his influence at the Embassy of Woodrow Wilson. I know he had an influence on domestic policy. I was wondering if uh, he also uh, had an influence on foreign policy. Oh, yeah, more, more, more of an influence on foreign policy. Uh, he was uh, uh, Wilson's very close uh, confidant. Uh, he's not, well, I wouldn't say like Karl Rove because Wilson wasn't a moron, but uh, uh, Colonel House. Uh, was like uh, Harry Hopkins to, to President Roosevelt uh, well, uh, afterwards. Well, he was from Texas and a Democrat. Um, I don't think it was a... a there, there's a, a separate thing that uh, some people say we went into war to guarantee the, uh, uh, the loans that uh, the uh, House of Morgan had made to Britain. And that's certainly true that they'd made big loans to Britain, which were dependent on Britain surviving the war and not uh, being crushed. And the House of Morgan didn't make any bones about it, that they were totally behind, behind the, the British war effort, as the New York banks in general were, uh, except for the Jewish banks, which were tended to be uh, pro-German, 
uh, because the Germans treated the uh, Jews a lot better than the Russians did, uh, until the Balfour Declaration, and that was one of the purposes of the Balfour Declaration, of getting Zionists behind the war effort. Uh, but international finance certainly played a role. One last uh, point, yes. Sorry, sorry, Jennifer. What is it? What? I'm sorry, what? Well, certainly I'm in favor of global uh, free markets. It uh, uh, depends on what role the state takes. You know, the American government's position now is that they're, they're promoting free trade. Like they have the North, uh, North American Free Trade a Agreement and now the Central American. And um, as uh, I think Walter Williams even says, I mean, you don't have to be a, a total Austrian or libertarian. This North American Free Trade uh, uh, Act, na the NAFTA, why do, you, you, why do you need a book of 700 pages uh, to, in, to enforce free trade, to establish free trade? What you need is to simply to, to uh, get rid of, of tariff barriers unilaterally, I would say, uh, and then you have free trade. But this is government-managed trade. Uh, and, uh, uh, and as far as globalization goes, well, then the U.S. government decides this country uh, now can engage in free trade with us, and, but that country can't because we don't agree with its regime and we're, we're trying to overthrow its regime. Uh, so, that, so that globalization on the basis of voluntary exchange, as far as I'm concerned, is terrific, but not managed by the government. Well, thanks very much, and go on. Good question.